this uh, series, the webinar series from Women Revolutionizing Housing. Uh, this topic is on cooperative housing for Aotearoa. Last month, we had cooperative housing in international perspective. So we were able to just learn about the concept. And now we want to really drill down this uh, month into how can we do this for this country? What do we have that's going for us that enables uh, cooperative housing? And what are the challenges or barriers that are um, still we need to get through? So I've invited uh, three speakers to join us. Normally, we have the co-host, Veronica, who's with the Women Revolutionizing Housing. She wasn't able to make it today, uh, but you have me. So my name is Zola Rose, and I'm with Common Ground, and I am um, hosting the, the series so that we can raise awareness of the different models of alternative kinds of housing that we've got and uh, to be able to um, have an opportunity to network and discuss with each other these ideas that each one of us might be interested to bring forward and find people who like the idea who'd like to pursue that with us. So that's the second half is going to be that networking. So please do stick around. So I'm just going to read out our guest presenters. So we have Sophie Watkin Hussens a PhD candidate at the School of Law, University of Canterbury. Um, she'll be sharing with us about her research entitled Cooperative Housing, A New Kiwi Dream. We have Roz Henry, who's Chief Executive Officer at Cooperative Business New Zealand, to share about how cooperative housing could be served by this existing structure. And we have Bobby Cornell, who's the founder of the Society for Cooperative Housing New Zealand, Scoop HNZ, and also with Closer, that Community um, Closer Living Opportunities. It's a housing development consultancy which spe specializes in this closer living opportunities. So these are our three today. And then we'll, at the end of each one of their presentations, we'll be able to have some q and I would say just two Q&A to begin with from, from each speaker. And then uh, if there's still questions hanging at the very end, we'll have those answered. And then we're gonna go into breakout small groups so we can have some discussion on the topic. So uh, out of the three speakers, um, Roz, you just happen to be in my, <laughs> in my speaker view at the moment. Um, would you like to get started with um, your presentation for us today? Thanks, Zola, and thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm going to actually share uh, some slides with you and race through them if I can. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, and thanks very much for inviting me to join you today. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. And for those of you who, had, who I haven't met, um, as Zola said, I'm the CEO of Cooperative Business New Zealand. Um, I've been in the role for about three years, and I am very passionate about cooperative businesses. Uh, I had um, my earlier career in the 90s with the Dairy Board, which is now Fonterra, and then I had about 15 years of management consulting, and subsequently I have had the last five years before this role with um, Auckland's Economic Development Agency, working in the international investment team, and so it was quite interesting during that period to just see the nuances of the, all the different business constructs that you could apply. And I, I'm quite mindful of how reliant we are in New Zealand in terms of the cooperative um, sector. Um, yeah, so that, that hopefully gives you a sense of who I am and um, why I'm passionate about the business model. In terms of today, um, as Zola said, you've obviously had uh, a number of you were involved in last week's, uh, um, the previous series, looking at the international sector. So I'll try and uh, not double up on that, uh, those presentations. Um, but uh, really want to just cover off uh, looking at who we are as an organisation, Cooperative Business New Zealand, looking at the uh, New Zealand market here, some of the issues that we're trying to work through, working with the likes of Bobby and um, some of the discussions that we're working through at the moment with Wellington. So just to set the scene, Cooperative Business New Zealand was established in the 80s, um, specifically for the agri-sector co-ops and the whole idea of that um, organisation was focused in on the agri-sector. Um, in the 90s, there was a recognition that in New Zealand, we've actually got a whole lot of cooperatives outside of the agri-space, and I'll take you through some of those logos shortly. Um, so we expanded that footprint to say we involve everyone who is a cooperative or member-owned business, 
And then um, in 2014, we were rebranded as Cooperative Business NZ. So if you hear the Association of Cooperatives or the Primary Sector Cooperative Association or Co-op Business NZ or NZ Coop, it's all one and the same. Uh, we are the only body that represents member-owned businesses here in New Zealand. And if you look at some of the um, notice notes here around guiding principles, we operate in a very similar way to other associations like Business New Zealand, Port New Zealand, etc. So uh, we're not funded by external, uh, by government at all. We are solely funded by our members. So I won't go into this, but really just to say that we do a whole lot of lobbying, um, which is <coughs> where I'll touch on today about some of those activities. We also host a number of forums where we bring our key members together and we try and touch on the key issues that they're focusing on. And right now we've got a leaders forum coming up in May. Um, Sustainability is one item that's on that um, on the uh, list of things to consider. The other one is around unconscious bias. Um, the other one is around uh, Maori engagement. How do we work with the Maori economy? Um, so it's it's quite broad, but recognising that there's a filter around member-owned businesses. Um, we also do specific governance education for our members, recognising that. In a co-op model, your governors, and, and I just think through this when we're thinking about um, cooperative housing, so the governors or the board of directors of that development uh, will be members, so they need to have the right skill sets for, to be sitting on the board and making the decisions, so we do a lot of governance education and training. Um, we also do um, celebrations of success with our members, so we do an annual business awards um, we're a member of the International Cooperative Alliance, which then links us up into the WTO and the UN. Um, we are currently working very closely with the universities here in New Zealand and also the Law Society and Chartered Accounting Australia and New Zealand, recognising that there's very little education right now in terms of co-ops. And again, we do quite a lot of the um, networking events for our members. Just in terms of our board, we've done quite a big reset. Um, it's really important that we have a board that's representative of our businesses uh, or our uh, different sectors. And so we've actually got a really broad uh, group now. And the one that I'm really excited about right now is Nicola Shadbolt. Um, Nicola, is, as you can see here, she's chair of Plant and Food. She sits on the Climate Change Commissioner Commission and she's also a senior lecturer at Massey University. So she's got lots of um, hooks into all sorts of different audiences for us. But as you can see, these individuals sit across a range of different industries, which is great for us. So I know that we touched on this, um, or you touched on this previously, but the really unique part of the co-op business model are these Rochdale principles. And these are managed and owned by the International Cooperative Alliance. Um, they make these businesses very unique. Um, and I guess the challenge is to make sure that when you get senior leaders, running these businesses that they really understand and they're running these businesses in the in this vein around open and voluntary membership, dem democracy, you know, economic participation and uh, that autonomy and independence is really about developing people. So if you think about cooperative housing, there's an opportunity to actually develop people's skills and give them the ability to actually have a real sense of self and pride. Um, the other areas is around the education and training. So uh, most cooperatives will, as a rule of thumb, offer their members um, the opportunity to upskill. Uh, we've got that whole piece around co co collaboration, and I'll touch on that shortly in terms of the opportunities I see here in New Zealand. And then obviously concern for community, that social responsibility. Where, and if you think about co-op housing, it's obviously something that's very um, a key part of what they're trying to achieve. So as I said, these principles are owned by the ICA and they are updated regularly. Um, last year they were reviewed and it's quite likely that um, number seven, Concern for Community, will actually be expanded out to also incorporate sustainability, recognising the need to hit that carbon neutral. What's quite interesting for those of you who are aware of B Corp certification, um, a lot of corporates right now are going for B Corp certification the reality is if you're a cooperative because of these principles, you tend to already be operating in that fashion. And so what we're finding is a lot of our members are very easily able to get B Corp certification to show that they are good um, 
corporate citizens and behaving in the way that's um, serving their members, their employees and their environment. So it's a really, really important part of their makeup. I'll just quickly touch on the international environment. So internationally, there's about three, 3 million co-ops and they generate about US 3 trillion annually, which is equivalent to the fifth largest economy globally. They employ 10% of the world's um, population or working population. So they're very significant. Um, they've got 1.2 billion members internationally and they're located across 145 countries. So globally, cooperatives are very well utilised, applied, but in saying that, they're still not really well understood. So it's quite an interesting dynamic. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done around the education piece. Um, what we tend to find is that they provide the fundamental services and infrastructure within societies. And um, many of them provide basic, um, they start out as basic businesses and then they evolve. So I think Fonterra from its grassroots, which um, was cheese um, manufacturing um, factory to what it is today. Um, it, it, it's amazing how they do evolve. And what is really special is if you look at third, third world economies, they quite often leverage the model and then they um, grow those businesses to move into a, um, you know, second and first world economies. Um, so as I said, the model's all about the um, members. It's not about a private investor. And so when you think about co-op housing, there's a huge opportunity there. Um, so these are all the things that we always keep in the back of our heads when we're thinking about, well, what other sectors here in New Zealand could actually leverage the model? And if you think about they could either be consumer owned, they can be supplier owned, or they can be employee owned. There's lots of different ways that that can be applied. And if you look at cooperative housing, again, there's the opportunity to create hybrid. So it might not just be the people living within those facilities who are the owners. It could actually be the workers as well who are actually running those facilities. So I mentioned before about um, that principle around collaboration. And what I've done here is I've circled some of those organisations that would be highly relevant to support um, establishing cooperative housing here in New Zealand. And a lot of these organisations are already on board. They see um, huge value and potential to do this type of work. Um, so they, they want to be part of the solutions. And um, I have to say from our side, we're very well, um, you know, it's, it's a real, uh, pleasure to be representing these businesses. Um, so there's very few on this um, chart that aren't currently members with us. Uh, pretty much 99% um, of this, these organisations are member with, members with us. And uh, as you can see, they sit across all sorts of different industries. So there's a whole lot of financial services ones, there's retail ones, there's ones in the construction sector, outside of the prim primary sector being agri and port. So it's a very applicable model to lots of different um, areas. Oh, excuse me. So in the last year, we did a piece of work um, looking at the New Zealand environment, and we reconfirmed how important these businesses are to the New Zealand economy. So they generate around about 18% of New Zealand's GDP, and that's just the cooperative. So if you think, if you think about Mighty Ten's head office, we were only looking at Mitre 10. We weren't looking at all of the individual store owners. Um, so if we actually looked at the bigger picture, that 18% would be significantly larger. The other thing to note is that they have about 1.5 million people who are members. Now, if I go back to that previous slide, you'll see that Southern Cross is a member. Um, so if you take out the 800,000 customers who own Southern Cross, yeah, that, that brings us down to about 700,000 people. Um, basically, there's probably about 40,000 of those um, members that are actually SMEs in their own right. So it's quite significant. Um, so they're a very big player in the New Zealand economy. They're also a significant employer. But again, it's only going back to the cooperative. We at this stage don't have visibility of all of those different SMEs and how many people they actually employ. What's interesting here in New Zealand, and it's one of the real challenges that all of the developers face um, trying to implement cooperative housing, is that in Australia, even though it's only 1.5% of their GDP versus our 18%, the government has done an inquiry and really understands the importance of cooperatives. So they 
are changing legislation. They are incorporating academia. Um, they are actually recognising that the lawyers and accountants need to better understand the model. model. They recognise that the ministers and the ministries need to better understand the model. So there's a whole lot of work that's been done in Australia that we're not seeing yet in New Zealand. So I spend a lot of time in Wellington trying to advocate on behalf of these businesses and get um, these sorts of a, this sort of information in front of them. But what's interesting is there's only 330 actual cooperatives in New Zealand. But as I say, of those 330, they've got 1.5 million members. So collectively, it's a significant proportion of the New Zealand economy. In terms of challenges, as I've already said, understanding the co-op business model is something that we are constantly tackling. Um, right now, for a lot of our members, uh, their focus is around access to workers. Obviously, in a um, housing cooperative, that's not so such an issue. Um, and where we see the value to the housing cooperatives is that they obviously utilise a lot of those individuals living within those facilities to do the work well. So it's a it's a win win. Um, I mentioned before about um, governance and making sure you've got the right skill sets coming onto the boards, and that is something that's really important. Um, access to capital, and I'm sure that Bobby can talk to this. Um, this is not just a co-op housing issue; it's a generic issue where cooperatives really struggle to get off the ground because they need access to funding. And right now, the way that the lending institutions work in New Zealand, they struggle to get their head around the whole concept of a co-op and the risk associated with it. So these are very real. Um, shareholder engagement, you know, part of the co-op housing is obviously bringing people and getting them signed up early so that you've actually got a guaranteed um, ownership construct. And it's no different for any of those other organisations. The next point around succession planning, we always need to be seeing who's coming through. So again, with co-op housing, it's the next generation coming through to take over this, um, the, the properties. Um, but internationally, we've seen that's been hugely successful. Um, there can be an interesting tension between the shareholders and the board, but that's actually healthy tension. And that's something um, that always needs to be considered. And in, in New Zealand, as I mentioned, the policy settings right now, that's, that's something that we do need to address. So I know that we've touched on this previously in terms of what co-op housing is, um, but I guess it's really, I think there's a concern here in New Zealand and it's not helped by the likes of dwellings such as Gloria Vale. I think there's a real sense of it's like it's communal or it's um, pippy dippy. It's not real. It's not tangible as opposed to, or it's going to end up being slum housing. Um, and that's absolutely not the case. We're seeing internationally that these um, facilities can be some really spectacular spaces with, um, as I say here, creative spaces, common areas, shared resources like communal gardening, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this slide previously, but internationally cooperative housing is, as I said, highly advanced, and it can be applied against a range of different um, housing ecosystems, which this slide talks to. And um, so, um, so I'll make the slides available to you afterwards so that people can see this. Um, so I know that you obviously had a person from Australia speaking at the last session, and I believe it was someone from the US. Um, yeah, so in Canada and Australia and, the, and Europe, we see a significant reliance upon the business model. Um, at the moment, there's talk about Peterborough Housing Estate and a number of others being cooperative. Legally, they are not cooperatives. They might be operating under some of those principles that I put up earlier, but they legally aren't cooperatives because it's so complex at the moment to actually set them up. So what tends to happen is that a trust owns the land and then there's all these different structures that sit around that. Um, yeah, so at the moment, I'm personally speaking to M. Hud and Kayanga Oro to look at ways of how we can actually pilot and showcase how important that these, this solution could be for New Zealand. And um, it's it's not easy, I have to say. It's not easy at all. We're, you know, we're really struggling to get the conversation going, but interestingly, National Party, um, Nicola Willis and now uh, Chris Bishop, who've taken over the housing portfolio, they're wanting to talk to us about it, and so there is work again going on in that space. Yeah, so when we go and talk to these different audiences, we put these sorts of um, stats up for them so that they can start to really consider, well, how's it done internationally and what could we be doing here in New Zealand? So. In terms of um, New Zealand, 
there's a number of things that we need to consider. We've got the issue around land availability. How do we actually get access to land that's, um, you know, preferential and um, doesn't have market value associated with it? There's that whole piece around resource planning that enables zones for this type of housing solution to be incorporated. So there's work to be done with regards to the um, Resource Management Act. We need to simplify legislation to enable um, easily establishing these businesses here in New Zealand. As I said before, the current requirements are high complex. Um, we need access to financial advice that's not financially prohibitive. So I know from talking to many people trying to get these businesses off the ground that they struggle as soon as they start talking to lawyers or accountants and, you know, the clock starts ticking. And as a rule, most, most organisations are trying to do something for a social cause. They're not actually trying to generate a whole lot of profit. So it's about, um, you know, how do they get the balance right? Who do they go to um, to seek that advice from? And I know that you've um, probably been speaking to the likes of Stephen Lowe, um, who's with Parryfield Lawyers, and they do quite a lot of um, work in the um, social space. Um, so where we see the opportunity is it really needs the backing of government. It needs to be sort of private-public relationships um, to really get the, these off the ground. And we also need the lending institutions at the table along with the insurance companies at the table. So that's potentially where we can come in. And we've also already engaged with SBS Bank and AMP to see how they might participate in this. Um, so I think once we get some case studies to prove it, um, then we actually will be in a good position. And our push at the moment is really saying, hey, look in Australia, they've got um, regional government involved in the development of these opportunities and what could we do, be doing to leverage that here in New Zealand? Um, yeah, so how do we actually adapt those approaches and bring them to New Zealand? I won't go through this slide, but it's really just to say there's all these different structures that could be applicable here in New Zealand. Um, and yeah, so these are on the table for consideration. The other thing to note is that um, internationally, the UN in conjunction with the International Labour Organization is really promoting the use of cooperatives and saying that governments need to incorporate um, thinking around when they're creating policy and legislation. So. This is quite a good lever for us when we're actually talking to the ministries and the um, ministers in terms of why, you know, why should we um, be incorporating cooperative housing? Why should we be supporting the establishment of these businesses? Um, and I go back to that point I made before. Internationally, we're seeing quite a big push to move away from capitalistic thinking to collective thinking. So this is really helpful for us in terms of telling that story. So just as a final point before I wrap it up, Really just to say, first home buyers, rent to buy, social housing, you know, there's all these different opportunities, retirement villages, we can leverage the cooperative housing to actually support these individuals and groups. Thank you, Roz, really appreciate the overview to hear that it's um, quite uh, an abundant uh, model for um, generating uh, jobs and income and uh, community, community wealth actually. Um, and that, yeah, you see with your work that you're doing that there is, you know, progress, slow progress being made. I just had a question for you. I'll jump in with since nobody else is jumping in. Um, my one question was on that uh, chart of all those different organizations, you hadn't circled cooperative bank. And I was just wondering as a financial institution that could possibly, because uh, I do do mortgage, uh, wh why that so, wasn't circled. Yeah, so absolutely. So um the ones that I circled specifically focused on the housing sector, but the reality is that if you look at the bigger picture, you could incorporate the cooperative bank, you could incorporate SBS bank, you could incorporate the insurance companies. Um, so there's a breadth of different organisations, but um, so it's not just in the construction space. Yes, yes. And I just to uh, remind everybody from those principles uh, to cooperate amongst cooperatives is mm. one of those principles. And just it just got me thinking that if there's all those cooperatives uh, that are already in operation, they obviously all have employees. Some of those employees would be, you know, lower income, perhaps earning within the organization. Wouldn't it be great to actually um, introduce the concept to some of those cooperatives to say, how are your people housing themselves? Do you actually have a group of people that might like to be part of a pilot um, and that would be a co cooperation between cooperatives. 
So that just, I, that, yeah, that just I, I absolutely agree with you. I think the one that I find really interesting is um, I don't know if you're aware of the sleepy head development going on. So they're building housing for their people near Pocono. Yeah, that would be the perfect scenario for a uh, cooperative housing development. Um, and as you say, you know, but if you look at seasonal solutions as an example, they bring in all the RSC workers from, from overseas. Again, perfect of example or opportunity to establish cooperative housing to support that community. Um, yeah, so that, there's lots of opportunities to push for it. It's just we need to get those pilots off the ground so we can showcase it. And it's just having the willing parties to create that public-private partnership to actually push it. And, but it needs the government on board. If we don't have the government on board, I just can't see how we actually change it. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Um, I see James, you you do, yep. Yeah, kia ora, Roz. James, good to you from Auto Regeneration. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Um, thanks for that um, presentation. It was really interesting, thanks. Um, I just wondered if you'd had any uh, connection with the likes of any build to rent uh, providers um, and simplicity, Sam Stubbs comes to mind with their development partner and, and what those conversations in a nutshell sort of look like and whether that had any legs. Um, look, uh, so Bobby, he's going to speak. There's a whole lot of different organisations looking to try and get cooperative housing off the ground. Um, they tend to be quite community centric. And I think in some ways we actually need to get involved with the bigger developers, as you say, to somehow bring them to the table. Um, it's So have we done work with Build to Rent? I've been having conversations with Kayanga Aura about Build to Rent, but I think the government's still very fixated on one solution. Um, you know, and I think you probably saw the announcement today from Megan Woods uh, with regards to saying no to considering um, an opportunity to fast track a development that was going to house about 5,000 people um, with one of the developers. So, again, I, you know, I, I'm not close enough to it. It's probably something that Bobby might be able to talk to, actually. All good. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, well, you'll be the last question. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, sorry that I arrived in a little bit late. Um, but my question is, so if beginning with pilots or thinking about those pilots, what would be, what would success look like or what are the sort of main, I suppose, foci of what would be examined in terms of saying um, this is what this is what success looks like, or yeah, I guess, yeah, it's it's very formative at this stage. So I That's guess it right. is around, thing, but just interested to hear how pilots would be evaluated, um, researched, assessed, really. I think I think we would have to look offshore to say, well, what's been done previously, and um, there's a number of different agencies who've done that. So there's the Urban Advisory Bureau. Um, there's obviously Bobby and her team at Closer and Scoop. Um, so they have a very clear picture of what success looks like. And it's really saying what internationally works. And so right now, I think there's a view that if we could get people out of long-term rentals and bring them into these communities where it's the long-term lease, if you like, within that facility, and they spend pretty much their whole, um, well, it doesn't mean to say that they're stuck there because that sounds, that sounds wrong, but it it's basically prevents them having to spend all that money on a um, rental property where they don't have any sense of ownership. If they're in a co-op, then they've got a real sense of ownership. They've got a desire to make sure that their house looks a certain way, their gardens look a certain way, they're sitting on the board or they're, they're part of the different community groups. And it's, it, it's depending on the audience. So if you looked at Ewe, it might be a different type of development versus um, a development like, like what I was saying before in terms of RSC workers or a development for workers within a, a factory. So it, it's really what are the needs look, what are the needs? Um, so what does success look like? How do we get to success? It's about simplifying the legislation. It's about getting the right heads around the table to say, let's get one or two of these off the ground. Um, and 
really seeing what does work or what doesn't work within the New Zealand environment and then making those, um, you know, refinements. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and there are a lot of successful examples. Uh, if you wanted to watch the YouTube uh, video of the last month, um, Julie from Cooperative Housing International does showcase many of those successful examples. Um, so, and you can also visit their website. So we're gonna move on to the next speaker. So Bobby started the Society for Cooperative Housing New Zealand a few years ago, and she invited me to sit on the board committee. And we worked uh, quite a bit. That's how we came to know Roz. And um, maybe Jillian is here, uh, um, who's on that, who's the chair. And uh, so, yeah, it was a lot of slog work because, you know, it's just a lot of talking to people who don't quite get it. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, being a pioneer in this space, particularly in housing. So I'm going to turn this over to Bobby, who's very visionary, uh, to have come up with this idea to even start the Society for Cooperative Housing. And, um, and what she's been able to accomplish. And uh, just to let you know, you can be a member, so it's not that expensive. And it allows the organization, if you even wanna give more to the organization, to be able to continue to do this work of opening doors for cooperative housing at the moment, running off of um, you know, some steam, uh, but the organization could definitely use some help. So <laughs> little plug for Scoop, because you know, I know the, the folks who've been working really hard to advance this mission. So I'm going to now um, hand it over to Bobby, and I've got her presentation, which she sent to me. Uh, so I'll be um, doing the, the, I'll be sharing that presentation with her guiding me. Uh, we've been here to share what everybody's doing. Um, so I'm Bobby Cornell, based in Tauranga, um, and my background is architecture. A few years ago, due to change in you know, life circumstances, I started really looking for community and affordable housing. So um, next slide, please. In uh, 2017, Closer was established, which is a social enterprise step to create affordable, connected living opportunities. Um, so really trying to connected living options. So something like a co-housing light process where the residents are brought in once all the nitty gritty has been sorted out. Um, in 2018, we secured land for a pilot project. So a very um, aligned landowner offered his orchard in, or ex-orchard that he'd purchased specifically for a community development. Uh, in Katikati. Uh, so we received a grant to do the feasibility study with Ohu consultants. And through that process, it was determined that a cooperative model would be the best fit to provide perpetual affordability. Uh, so we proceeded to design a 19 house um, development with two to three compact eco homes, large common house, and a lot of shared amenities. The council was very supportive of our proposal. Um, however, it took a very long time to move it forward. And continuing on to 2018 and 19, it was really lots and lots and lots of conversations. Next slide, please. So talking to everybody, trying to bring together the pieces, which were, um, you know, we had the land, we were building the community, so online and through events and uh, so on. Um, the financials and the legals were a key part, and then the development uh, delivery was the last part, which we didn't quite get to, but still needed to uh, track out all those steps in order to you know, plan the project and check its viability. Uh, so hundreds of professional people over these few years have contributed their time and knowledge and you know, enthusiasm towards creating cooperative solutions. Um, Closer's team of directors changed and kind of up, um, what do you say, moved, moved up in terms of capacity and skills. Uh, throughout the whole process, a lot of positive feedback from every level, but slow progress. Um, so as Roz mentioned, you know, there's just a huge inertia uh, in terms of adopting or supporting something that's a bit new and different, despite the international uh, track record. Uh, so the biggest 
achievement, I think, here was that we um, secured uh, indicative offers for uh, development and mortgage lending through SBS Cooperative Bank, but still needed half a million equity to draw that down, which unfortunately we weren't able to secure in time. Uh, we did have half of that pledged, um, but just finding more money was more conversations, more time. Um, and in the end, the landowner couldn't wait. We extended our um, memorandum of agreement from one year to one and a half to two years. And then he had changes in situations, uh, his, his life situation and the prices were just going astronomical. So he pulled out uh, many, many events happened through um, all the different people working in the space. Closer has over, a well, close to a thousand people interested in um, it's it easier for people to jump into it when it happens. Okay, 2019, next slide. So uh, 2019 was established to work along several projects and uh, to be able to work with cooperative housing projects. So with Closer, we secured a another grant, which is one of the reasons Scoop was established to be able to receive philanthropic funding um, to be able to share with a, a wider audience. So the grant was um, conditional upon applicant in Katikati at the time, I guess, but also a co-funding offer, which we were unable to find the balance of in order to proceed. So this is a group of you know volunteers trying to find time to have all these amazing conversations, but just an uphill battle. So skip forward to um, this year, we've just had our third AGM and we've reformed with a, a largely new committee with some great experience and passion to fuel the path forward. And Zola's um, shared the link, I believe. Uh, please join and lend any skills and ideas you may have to make this happen. <coughs> so at the end of, not in 2020, um, Yeah, we just lost oh, 2020, the Katikati pilot project. Um, yeah, we, we steamed ahead with the concept design, lined up a team ready to go, detailed financial, link, financial modeling, all of this pro bono um, through Closer and our partners, you know, including the urban advisory and so on, who were really committed to supporting, making this happen. Um, but unfortunately, in the end, the landowner couldn't wait any longer. Um, and we'd say we probably got 80% of the way there and just run out of, run out of time. Um, confident we could have got there with what we had, but it was just a matter of time, which we didn't have. Uh, so in 2021, um, spent a few months looking now, or I did, um, more on the, uh, co-op in Zealand looking for co -op, uh, opportunities for cooperative housing. So, for example, Aura and Tauranga, um, Darren Toy have said, yep, we're interested in doing this, but not right now. Um, in December 21, so less than six months ago, uh, an opportunity for an urban residential site was made available by actually my parents. <laughs> So I managed to convince them to sign another 12 month MOU, holding the land at an agreed market price so we can apply a, a urban apartment cooperative model. Um, be really you know, relevant to the new density rules being introduced. Concept design was prepared, uh, early expressions of interest received from national and local and international people and and the project's currently live. So that's um, what we're working on right now. So 10 to 12 units on you know, a standard suburban site of 800 square meters, um, one, two, and three to four bedrooms, 50 to 115 square meters. 
with amazing shared amenities, a huge rooftop terrace, a commercial space for cooperative income. Um, and the location is, you know, the very close to public transport, uh, lots of services um, and near the beach. So what we're aiming for is something that is more affordable than anything you can get in the area, probably around two thirds of the price of the million dollar terraces that are going up in, uh, along the same street. Residents interested in the uh, offering, which is initial estimates of 500 to 900,000, which includes all the shared amenities and one or two larger units being sold at a premium. <coughs> so a grant's been secured to determine the legal structures and to prepare an investment memorandum to invite investment into the pre-construction stage which is uh, the developed design, uh, detailed costings and delivery and legal structures, which will define a clear package, which will enable uh, the future residents to purchase off the plans. So there's a lot of work there. And the main barrier right now is the development finance because it's no longer in a position to offer that. So we believe we plus the land is security and um, risks in the current building environment, costs and materials, timing, and uh, much more risk adversity in lending institutions. People who are handing out money before are no longer doing so. Also a large barrier for us to get through. We're looking at how we might be able to involve residents while at the same time, you know, mitigating the risk. So can we actually invite the residents to invest at an early stage or not? Um, looking at various solutions, but offering, you know, including things like build to rent, can we build to rent to buy for our group? But a lot of these solutions from the government are not uh, really uh, for a group who may have first home owners. Some people already have a property, but they'd sell that to come into this. And they're also not really designed to build. Uh, Kiwi Banks also just announced the co-owned product was aimed at, you know, parents and children or a, a couple of friends. As far as I know, there's no limit on the number of people, but still it's a individual residential property as opposed to a group. Um, scenario. So we will look into that further, but not holding our breath. So 2022 continued. Next slide. As the founder of both in the Society for Cooperative Housing New Zealand and also recently a core member of the Arataki Apartment Pilot Project, being somewhere that I would love to live with my kids. Uh, forward, I believe. It's obvious I'm convinced that residential cooperatives are a very relevant way forward for New Zealand and I'm not alone. Support self-determined solutions. Meanwhile, we accept that the first residential cooperative will need to compromise in order to happen in a timely way. So this means, you know, if it has to be unit titles, we'll do whatever we have to with the bank, do whatever we can that's practical and still retain um, cooperative principles um, as all the recent co-housing projects have. They've all compromised to get there. Eventually change will happen. However, we don't have time. Every year we wait, we have to, is a high cost to society and the households who are sinking further into housing stress and despair. We need high level awareness, which many people are working on, uh, Ro, Ros in particular, and adoption of a multitude of great research skills and resources we have locally just awaiting activation in New Zealand. So we have all the parts, let's unlock them. Just move on to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bobby. That is so much work that you've put in. And, uh, yeah, we're hoping you're going to be the first. Not really any questions, but just congratulations because the persistency and tenacity is... Um, admirable to say the least yes um i'm sorry i'm sorry showing my ignorance a little here 
but I don't understand what what is meant by cooperative housing. Is it only the legal structure that the unit's held under that is different from what we experience at the moment with apartments and that sort of living? Yeah, I think Ros had a slide with the different types of cooperatives, which might be a leasehold, um, part equity or, or full equity. Um, so it's really where a group of people are responsible for the ownership and management of the property. So there's other parties involved. Maybe Ros but could isn't... show that slide. Yeah, I, I tried to pick that slide, but it moved too quickly. Um, mm. But yeah, getting people together in groups to agree to anything, how do we handle that? Uh, that's one of the things that CLOSE is uh, trying to make it easier for people. So actually having a vision before you bring the people together saves a lot of time, similar to the co-housing process, which usually brings people together before the vision. So that's one way to uh, fast track the community, bringing the community together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's um, just to, just to um, if you're interested in that sort of how does the people part work, uh, Cooperative Housing International uh, does have a bunch of videos on their website, which talks around those nitty gritties. How do you get people together? And those discussions, how do you have those discussions? So yeah, that's a great resource. Again, there's a YouTube video um, under Common Ground and then on the website, you can get directly to that. Okay, we're gonna go on to our last speaker before we then move into small groups for a little discussion. So we've got Sophie, there you are, great. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sophie. Um, and anyone else, please put yourself on mute so we don't get any background noise. Okay. Hello, thank you Zola for inviting me to this uh, panel discussion on cooperative housing. I'm going to share my screen. So uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Canterbury and I'm a trained lawyer actually from the beginning. That's why I'm investigating cooperative housing from a legal point of view. And I'm trained in Sweden, France and Germany. So I have a bit different legal background than New Zealand. And so the starting point of my PhD was when I moved to New Zealand uh, four and a half years ago, I was quite surprised by the housing market and especially by the lack of other options than just renting or buying or the, or the public, or public housing. So yeah, this lack of what I call institutionalized cooperative housing was kept quite surprising for me. And what I mean by that is that there is no specific legislation on cooperative housing. And subsequently, there is no public agency representing cooperative housing. And I was even more surprised because of the housing crisis. I was thinking there is a real affordability issue with, as I noted, um, I wrote here that the ratio house prices um, in um, the lowest um, range of the scale, because it's more now around nine, especially in Auckland and Tauranga. And for housing to be considered affordable, the ratio should be no higher than three. So you can see really the, the gap. And then, so, and so there is this aspect of housing affordability. And then I realized the real dual aspect of the open market, as I mentioned, you can choose between renting or owning, and there is no real middle ground. And what I call the Kiwi nightmare, which is our purgatory, because as uh, I don't remember, maybe it was Rose who said it, that renting is only a stepping stone, is not seen as a proper way of being housed. So basically, um, tenants are trying to save money in order for, in order to buy a house in the future. And, but the problem is, it's getting more and more difficult for tenants to actually buy a house. So they get stuck in this purgatory. 
So these were the two aspects that for me could justify cooperative housing. And then there is also a purely legal aspect that I was thinking, hmm, New Zealand has ratified some inter international instruments such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which states that state parties must ensure that they provide an adequate standard of living to the best of their abilities. And so what does it entail? It contains several criteria, but among these criteria, I'm especially interested in affordability and the legal security of tenure. And I was thinking, New Zealand doesn't really provide that. I couldn't find any, any legal document stating, any act stating the goal is to provide affordable housing and legal security of tenure. So for me, these two aspects stem from actually different, different reasons. And one of the main issues that I found against the promotion of corporate housing is seeing housing as an investment. So basically since the 80s and the, the regulation, housing policies have, have focused on not, in, um, not intervening as much in the housing market. So there is this, this belief or this faith in the market to self-regulate and governments are quite reluctant actually to then intervene, intervene actively in it. So we've seen, for example, they used a lot of the supply demand leverages and tools, but they don't do much more than that. They really focus on the market, can provide for itself, it can self-regulate, so we don't need to intervene. And then there is another aspect uh, that is important in New Zealand is how welfare and especially retirement um, has an influence on the housing market because uh, Kiwis have been told that they have to be self-sufficient in retirement. So how do you do that? So for example, you build equity on your house. So that's why New Zealand has a property ladder because you build wealth for yourself and equity by changing house and upscaling every time. And then if you're lucky enough, you can even invest into properties. So acquire additional properties to rent out. And this is how you create an additional income. And I, I found as a, as, a last, as a last reason as well, that even though New Zealand has ratified these international instruments on the, on the human right to housing, it hasn't incorporated it into domestic law. So there is nothing in the Human Rights Act on, or the Bill of Rights Act that says anything about the, the human right to housing. So somehow citizens are under the impression that there is no human right to housing. So why should we intervene? So how, how have I uh, conducted my research? So I haven't found much um, literature around cooperative housing in New Zealand and especially not legal literature. So I had to go and interview different housing actors uh, throughout New Zealand. So in the main centers, I've been to Dunedin, Queenstown, Auckland, Wellington, a bit everywhere. And I've interviewed uh, housing collectives. So the residents. I've interviewed councils, I've interviewed community housing providers, uh, architects, different people in order to create case studies. And then after I gathered all this information, I identified common features and impediments. Uh, so common features between housing collectives and impediments to the, to the wider promotion of cooperative housing. So I found that there is predominantly unit titles. So there is, I think there are two reasons for that. It's because there is already a quite comprehensive uh, legal framework with the Unit Titles Act. So that's why it feels safe, I think, for, for new housing collectives to use this piece of legislation. And then there is experience from previous 
from, from existing collectives such as Earth Song, for example, uh, or Peterborough, or the new Toyota uh, High Street co housing as well in Dunedin. So many have used this model. So it feels quite safe. And especially because if you want to come up with innovative solutions, you have to contact law firms or contact experts, which costs a lot of money and it's time consuming and you never know what the outcome will be. So yeah, so that's one of the reasons. And I found some common impediments. Many, many uh, collectives have, have talked about the same issues about taxation, depending on if they are classified as a charity or as a limited liability company. So taxation is an issue, finding bank financing. So having to basically erase any mention of collective housing in the, in the sales and purchase agreements or any document to not scare off banks. Um, the RMA, so land zoning was an issue as well. And there, there was, a real like a constellation of different reasons and then a general suspicion towards shared ownership as well as a lesser type of tenure than ownership which which of a fee simple for example which is seen as the highly ground so yeah the second part has been comparative research because i needed to to see i mean i'm familiar with european models uh, especially the Swedish and French ones. But I think it would be actually easier to start with a closer neighbor because I think it feels safer for Kiwis to at least have existing examples that are more familiar to them. So I chose Australia uh, because for different reasons. First, it's a well-known neighbor. They also are um, common law jurisdiction. They apply the Torrance uh, principles uh, in land law, like New Zealand, and they are quite similar um, socioeconomically as well. And so I won't go through maybe the, <laughs> because uh, there was already a presentation, I understand about, about the Australian model, so I won't go through it again. But what I found especially interesting is rental cooperatives, which is actually a very European model. So, and which Australia uses, which means it's possible. So I, I think I was quite pleased to see that. And so I'm writing, uh, yeah, I have a whole chapter about Australia where I present the model. And so why, why do I do all this? Why? do I do an empirical and then comparative research? Well, it's to suggest a law reform in New Zealand. How can we legally make cooperative housing happen? So I suggest two types of reforms. Uh, so amend the existing legislation. So we have different, different acts, acts already existing. And many of the participants I have interviewed are quite keen on, on just modifying actually the, the current legislation. They don't really want a new one. So they think what we have is already satisfactory. We did just need to add or change some, some aspects. And, uh, and so, oh yeah, I just, um, just forgot to mention when I talked about unit titles and that most housing collectives in New Zealand are created using unit titles. I was surprised to find that none of them, no collectives has used uh, the Cooperative Companies Act, actually. So no, no housing collective is a cooperative company. So I was really surprised because it means, as Ross said, there is no cooperative housing in the strict sense of the term in New Zealand. So I, I find it yeah, quite, quite interesting. And so I also suggest a so-called hard reform, which would mean a whole new cooperative housing act based on the, or inspired from the legislation, from the Australian legislation, which yeah, would be quite an easy way actually to, uh, to implement cooperative housing. So yeah, this is what my thesis is about. It's a very brief presentation. Uh, yeah, it's really in a nutshell, of course, but if you're interested in he hearing more, I would be very happy to answer your questions and yeah, um, if Zola can, can share.
the email addresses afterwards, then I would be happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. I think it's fantastic from a legal perspective where we see that the block is and the opportunity. So thank you very much for choosing to do your PhD study on this and um, in your own way, you know, pushing out the information and advocating for this. So um, I'm opening it up now to um, any questions for Sophie. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Sophie. That was very interesting. You, you started at the beginning talking about the affordability, which is an issue for me. Um, so how would that sort of weave into the legislation that you're planning to push for? It's exactly as Rose suggested, we need public intervention because if it's only purely based on private investment, it's just, <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic around that, but it's quite, it's very yeah. difficult to implement. You, you need some form, especially for example, in Switzerland, what is very common is um, uh, councils, council, sorry, leasing land. So that's a really good, uh, a good possibility to to you know to have lower land costs which we know are quite high at the moment and then they provide some grants as well to build to build the dwellings on that so yeah it's 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 very rarely it's not completely private you have usually this what rose called the public private partnership which mm. helps because otherwise you will have to go through a normal property development and we see how expensive it is and how risky it can be as well. So what I've seen, for example, with existing housing collectives in New Zealand where people have invested their own money into the project, it's first you need, here you need to have potential residents who already are quite wealthy, who already own a house or two houses that can sell them and then, can invest the money into mm. a collective project. And so it doesn't really contribute to housing more vulnerable people with mm -hmm. lower income or mm. who for any reason need, need some help, some support. So mm. that's, yeah, so you need public intervention, definitely. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, really interesting and great work that you're doing. I'm just wondering if you've looked at all at Maori trusts because you know, our, our neighbours across the road are living in a shed um, on Māori trust land with 45 owners. Um, how does that interact? Is there a possibility they can use this kind of change in legislation? Yeah, yeah, I've looked into it. I must say it's very complex. And unfortunately, I don't have all the, you know, enough time to really, to really look into everything. Even Papakanga I had a look at. But yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I'm very inspired because at the moment, especially the government is pushing for Papakainga. So I follow how they set up the structure because actually we could be inspired by that for cooperative housing. So uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately not an expert in Maori Trust. Um, so, but yeah, it's definitely something I look into because it's actually, they, they have a good model. So, <laughs> so yeah. Oh, hi. Um, thank you, Sophie, for your presentation. Um, my question is, uh, well, true, a comment. Uh, Papakaianga, maybe they're doing such a good job that we don't need cooperative housing. Maybe it's closely aligned. I don't know. I don't get why uh, we have to fight to get um, support from government. I mean, we've met with one minister several times. She, got, she says, said she got it. Uh, that's our own um, MP, uh, Jan Tanetti, and um, yeah, no, we haven't heard anything since. Um, Megan Woods, uh, she, they must be aware. This is a recording, so even, you know, taking extracts from it and editing it and somehow getting it under their noses, I just don't know how to shift it. My question, though, coming to that, um, cooperative uh, company you mentioned, Sophie, uh, is that easy and one is it something a project could possibly do to push in and two would it be taxable everything be taxable um, I think I mean 
I don't know if we can uh, as well shift the question to Rose because I think she might be interested as well in replying. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've looked, uh, I've started to look into cooperative companies and it's, I'm a bit like, how do you say? Um, I, I, I'm still not exactly sure like cooperative companies are exactly, I mean, for one type of, of um, cooperative housing, I think it's the right type of structure. For example, if we would have big scale rental cooperatives, that would be really interesting actually, because we see there are already big cooperatives like Fonterra. So if we have a um, professional organization that is in charge of developing rental cooperatives, that would be, I, I think that would be great. And I've seen in Sweden, it's very common, like there are cooperative companies that offer rental cooperatives. So I think for this type of projects, definitely for smaller scale, no, I think for smaller scale, uh, we're looking at more, maybe some um, an variation of unit titles, I would say, would be more appropriate. Yeah, there are, I mean, there are different, yeah, I don't know if you want to reply, Rose, maybe on that. Well, I was just going to add to what um, you're saying, Sophie, and say there's definitely tax benefits if um, mm. you can um, set up under a co-op company structure. Mm. So. Um, that, that is one of the benefits and the early question in terms of which I'm sorry, just typing away to respond to in terms of engagement with Māori iwi. Um, we've had a lot of conversations. The challenge is that under co-op structure, you're basically rel relinquishing control from the senior elders and giving it to the people. And that doesn't always align with some of the fundamental thinking. So they tend to use more trust but what we are trying to say is, hey, there's a really big opportunity here to upskill within your communities, whether you whether you use it for co-op housing or you use it for business. It, but it's that real mindset change of the ownership, who's who's in charge. And so the members are in charge, not the elders. And it's it's you know, you've got to really understand what are you trying to achieve. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just about uh, the taxation aspect, uh, I've seen many housing collectives had to create, of course, a limited liability company, and then it has created so many issues in terms of GST, because even the IRD is not exactly sure how to tax this kind of project, so it has created a, a real a mayhem for many housing collectives, and yeah, and, and, and again, it's another impediment, so yeah. costly, time consuming, so yeah. Just, um, just also add to that, right now we've got small co-op companies legislation going through the FMA and one of the things that we're putting on the table as you're going to talk to them next week is around how they we could leverage that legislation to enable um, the development of co-op housing. Um, yeah, so just for those of you who, if you are, have got a legal background, um, have a look at that piece of legislation and if you've got any feedback or comment on that, sing that sing out because we'd really appreciate that. Oh, great. Well, I'm glad that you brought it up because I had forgotten to mention um, at the beginning is that there's a few ways to keep in touch. Uh, the one is joining the Women's Revolutionizing Housing Network. So that's just a, that's a database where I can send out, but that's really just a me to you. There is also, if you look at the um, page, Women Revolutionizing Housing page that is set up on the Common Ground website, there's an opportunity to join the Mighty Network. So that's a little bit like how a Facebook group would operate, where you join the group and then you can interact with the members in that group directly with a little bit of guidance from time to time. Um, I just, I think, asked, there's like a membership of $5 or something like that um, if you wanted to join just because it is a network that does cost me money to run. I had to pay for a subscription so that I wasn't having to use Facebook. Um, so it's a non-Facebook uh, way to be able to bring up topics that might interest others and discuss, find the, the nice thing about the app is that it's also location oriented. So people can put in where they are and find other people in, in a similar geography. So there's a bunch of um, benefits to having that particular network. So there's that. Um, and then I have a survey at the end, which I'll send to you all, which actually asks for your feedback on how was today 
and how might like you to stay in touch. So it could be that we have another one of these uh, between, maybe in a fortnight, but you can put your ideas onto that survey so that I know what would work for you to keep in touch and to keep this, this topic alive.